Bonjour, this Bonjour. is Bertrand from My Pride Paris. Bonjour, uh, Manuel. Bonjour, Bertrand. This is Manny. How are you guys doing? We are uh, actually, well, you guys can guess, in front of the Eiffel Tower. I think that's the name. That's the Eiffel Tower. And it is uh, COVID time, so we're going to put our masks on. Uh, we keep a social distance between the two of us, but for this video, it's better to keep uh, our masks on. And we have brand new microphone, wireless microphones. So the sound should be quite good. I hope, I hope it's good because Manuel has some amazing stories uh, to tell us uh, about the Eiffel Tower. And today it's a very exciting and challenging uh, live tour we're giving you because we are going to climb the Eiffel Tower on our two legs. Uh, this is a challenge Manuel has given me. I've always used the um, elevator to go up the Eiffel Tower, and but today we're going to do a little bit of sport. Uh, personally, it's been six months I'm not guiding, so I need to exercise uh, a little bit and going up the Eiffel Tower, some 600 stairs. A little bit less than 670, and it's also a challenge for me because I didn't tell you that, but I kind of have a phobia of elevators. Okay. So let me, for you the hard part is the stairs, for me the hard part is taking the elevator. So that's going to be fun. Because yes, uh, one thing important is to go up to the first platform and then to the second, we can use the stairs. There are stairs that go all the way to the top, but it's not accessible for the public. No, they're used as emergency stairs and that's actually a better thing because you got to remember that there's about 670 stairs all the way to the second floor and then there's more than a thousand extra to the top. An extra thousand? An extra thousand. It's a total of 17, 10 steps all the way to the third floor. All right, but you, we're being nice on me and we do just yes. one and two. I want you to stay alive, so we're just going to go to the second floor. Yes, thank you for that. Um, and then it's possible when you buy your ticket on site to add a few extra euros and you can get the elevator from the second to the top. Absolutely. So you have two formulas to get to the summit, either do it all the way to the top with the elevator or go to the second floor with uh, the stairs and then take the elevator from the second to the third. Because, I, because, sorry, because there are two sets of elevators. There's so one that go ground to the second. I've used that yes. one very often. Uh, and then you switch to another one that goes only from the second to the top. Absolutely. Uh, there are two different sets of elevators, so you can have the choice and also so they have less problems because when they <laughs> opened it, it was a bit of a problem. I mean, you gotta remember when the tower opened, we're gonna talk about it. The actual, the actual elevators didn't work all the way to the top, so they had to climb. Eiffel actually climbed all the way to the top. Yeah, he wasn't that young of a gentleman, so that was, uh, that was a long time. Okay, 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 okay. So you're playing it nice on me. He did it, so I can do it, right? I'm just saying, I'm just saying. All right. So we're going to start walking because there's still quite a distance uh, to the Eiffel Tower and meet you guys right at the bottom of the Eiffel. Absolutely. And let's get started. Let's get on it. No, 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 no. All right, so since the Eiffel Tower is nearly half a mile away, it doesn't look so much on the screen, but we are going to walk uh, quite a little bit. We're going to um, show the images at a much faster speed. But in the meantime, uh, can you tell us, Manuel, a little bit more about the location, uh, the, all this green area we have uh, around? Yeah, so this area is called Champ de Mars in French, or Martian fields in English. I know that sounds kind of interesting, Martian fields. What does that have to do with the planet? Well, the planet is named after the god of war. Some of you remember Mars, not just the chocolate, the Roman god of war. <laughs> yes. Yes. He's pretty tasty as a god. And the idea is that this is named after the one in Rome. Why? So the one in Rome was used for, sure, celebrations, but also for the military, as training and as demonstrations. And if you turn around, when you come to the Champ Mars, the Martian fields, on the opposite side of the Eiffel Tower, you are going to have an old building from the 18th century. And that is the old military school. There seems to be a, a rather new building or a building being built right now. Absolutely. So the weird kind of structure you can see right now that should be done by 2021, again, crossing fingers, touching wood, blah, blah, blah. That structure is the temporary Grand Palais. So we have a great palace, Grand Palais, uh, close to the Seine. And we are closing it for uh, renovation until 2024 and you let the gates. Ah yeah, the Grand Palais down the Champs-Elysees. Absolutely. 
down the Champs Elysees, uh, close to the Concorde, and they're building. And so that's one. what they're building right there. Absolutely, the one you can see all the way to yep, the back. Yep, yep, right Pointing here. With the finger. Yep. That one is going to be um, temporary, and they're also going to have it for the Olympics. And uh, apparently, they're going to have judo, I think, over there. Wow. Yeah, judo and wrestling. That's what I've read, but they're changing that basically every day because they're cutting budget. Yeah. Kind yeah. Of I, I heard fencing also, or was that, or is fencing it a in the original Grand Palais? Yes. Uh, fencing and something else. And here, the Champ Mars was uh, planned to be beach volley, but again, subject to change. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's an interesting place to play beach volley. It, it would be, yeah. Unless, you know, in the middle of the game, you start gazing at the Eiffel Tower and you get the ball in your, uh, on your head, but... Yeah, it's a... It's, it's a risk, a it's a risk to take. And, and I, we see uh, out there, so it's not, I mean, this, this is this great garden, it's a public garden, we can say, uh, but there are also some houses. Yes, absolutely. So you've got to remember that Paris is a very pretty city and I will not take no for an answer. And Paris is still also very much a city that's alive. So a lot of people live here, even in this kind of beautiful toys neighborhood. So this neighborhood is actually not just a regular neighborhood. It is probably the fanciest neighborhood in France. It's called the 7th district. The yes. Arrondissement. And it's known for being beautiful, but also very, very, very expensive. How expensive? We're talking apartments that go for 20,000 euros uh, square, uh, square meter. So that would be about, yeah, two grand per square foot, which I think is a, is a pretty, pretty hefty price. Two grand, oh yeah, yeah. yeah, that's, yeah. So that's quite a bit of cash. And this... You don't live here. I don't live here. No. We, we live in the uh, east or... Yes. We live where... Uh, where it's... Neighbors aren't so pretty. <laughs> but the towers yeah. aren't FL and just like projects. Exactly. Um, and this neighborhood was famous. We used to have a wealth tax in France because we love taxes. We're French, that's what we do. And uh, basically, if you earned more than a million euros a year, you would pay uh, what is called impôt sur la fortune, tax on fortune, and a third of households in this neighborhood would pay it. That is an insane amount. A third of the household here, they make more than a million a year. More than a million a year. So we can call it a fancy district. Yeah, it's, it's, it's rather expensive. So basically a lot of massive buildings over here, massive uh, hotel particulier, so um, basically private mansions. A lot of them have been bought uh, by foreigners from the Middle East, from Russia, from Africa. The way people invest in real estate in Vancouver or London or places like those. Yeah. Same idea. Here. So it's not necessarily a, a, an area where people actually leave, uh, but it's it's a good place for uh, investment. And but, that was the idea with the Eiffel Tower, right? It was some kind of uh, an investment by the uh, founder. Or we're going to talk about this later. We're going to talk about it because it's more than an investment. It's also showing off. Uh, it was a way for the French state to display its might and power back when we used to kind of matter in the world. Right now, debatable. Okay. Now, the idea is that, yeah, this neighborhood, not so great for nightlife, but really beautiful to stroll around. You can have her. Sure. <laughs> okay, uh, I have a question. Because if you look at the Eiffel Tower right now, there seems to be uh, some renovation work or s for the least scaffoldings uh, right here uh, in the middle. Um, what's happening, you know? Yeah, I mean, it looks like a, a tiny Arc de Triomphe in terms of scaffolding, but it's not a reminder of the monument. This, all the scaffolding is over here for the renovation of the tower and it's actually repainting it. Well, repainting it and checking the metal for fatigue and just general health of the tower. So that's something regular that they that do here. something that is scheduled indeed. So the idea is from the first floor all the way to the summit. So from the first floor all the way to the top, they repaint it every five years and the rest of the monument every 10 years. Okay. And you can see over here scaffolding. So actual people that go up and down, but they have also hired teams of mountaineers. People rappel down the building. They're actually mountaineers from the Alps. They come here on a seasonal basis. Wow. They rappel down the building and they're kind of the doctors of the tower. They check the metal for fatigue and they repaint it. Why wow. they're repainting? Um, might not be visible on the picture, but there is a bit of rust on it. Because the Eiffel Tower was made before stainless steel was invented. Stainless steel was invented in a very 
early 1900s, and the Eiffel Tower is about 15, 20 years older than that. So this is actually wrought iron. The same one you see in the back. You're kidding. Rest. Yeah, it's iron. So it does. No, but it, it rusts, yeah. It rusts, and the idea is that you cover it in paint to A, make it pretty, and B, avoid rust, which could be a problem. Another thing too is the Eiffel Tower has changed its color multiple, multiple times. So if you look at all the pictures in the history of the tower, it actually went all the way to basically yellow, to red, to brown. Yellow, I knew yellow, but red? It was really painted in red? A very dark red. Okay, So like rust. Kind of, <laughs> yeah, like healthy rust. Yeah. <laughs> and nowadays, because it's pretty hard to tell, uh, is it uh, gray or brown or? So it's a kind of shade of brown, but they're sort of cheating. The color is actually not the same all along the height of the tower. The color changes varying on height for a simple reason. So it fits in with the sky. So it's not, lit it's not exactly the same color. It's not actually uh, the same For the shade. bottom we see right now on the screen. Absolutely. And the color changes. When you get higher up the tower. And the color but it looks the same. It looks the same, that's the idea. Because you're gonna have more light on the top of the tower, so you have to adjust the color to make it look the same. It's like perspective. Sometimes you have to cheat with the angle. Same thing here, you cheat with the shade. And not only that, but also the sky makes it change color every day. Today it's a bit cloudy, which I think is yeah. great. Uh, Paris is a city made to look good. When it's clouds. cloudy. Absolutely. Because the city, if you look, is beige and green and brown, so it looks better with a kind of grayish sky, not a blue sky. Which is really pretty sad, but this is who we are as French people. We're, we're sad and dramatic, so we like gray sky. <laughs> we like to be sad. Well, exactly. We thrive on it. It's we're, not fun. We're happy when we're sad, yes. Exactly. And the tower will change color. If you come here on a bright sunny day, it will look lighter than it actually is. That's true. So this is why color is kind of subject to debate. Uh, some of you might remember the few years ago there was a debate about the a color of um, a, a skirt on the internet. Some said it was blue, some said it was uh, yellow. Yeah, yeah. Well, same kind of idea. We, well, anyway, we see colors uh, somehow differently. Absolutely. Okay. Well, so we're actually living a historical moment, but that happens uh, regularly. Yeah. The repaint of the Eiffel Tower. All right, so we're going to walk some more uh, and um, actually get our tickets yes, that to, to go up. So we'll see you guys uh, back there. So we've finally reached the entrance and you know, it's not crazy, but it's not empty either. There's still a, a few people, maybe some like 50 or so. Anyway, uh, you have to be checked for security. Absolutely. So that always slows down a little bit the, uh, uh, the line because the line here we see is actually for people who already have their tickets. Well, people who don't have their tickets, uh, there doesn't seem to be... Uh, there usually is a separate line. But it seems to be, it seems to be quite the same. Yeah. Okay, yeah. so we'll be in line. We'll, we'll tell you guys for how long we've been uh, in line. But it's pretty nice view. Uh, so we'll be patient, I guess. Yes. All right, we're in. So it's taken us about 10 minutes to go yeah. through security. Not too bad. They check your bags, uh, if you have your belt, you know, all the uh, classic uh, stuff. And we now are, I'm going to try to get the best angle up right here. Manuel, I have to say you look fabulous with the Eiffel Tower right behind you. Thank you, but you're taken. <laughs> And I was uh, wondering, what's the, uh, what's the idea, what's the concept behind the, the creation of the Eiffel Tower? So the whole idea, uh, as I said before, is impressing, or as young people say, flexing. This is really it. We built the tower not to be beautiful, but to be powerful. This was made to prove the superiority of France and how we had the best engineers and the best everything. Why? Back in the day, Universal Exhibitions, aka World's Fair, they're a huge thing. And France is having one in 1889 to celebrate the 100 year anniversary of the French Revolution. Kind yeah. of a big thing in world history. That's true. And to celebrate that, they said, we need a building that's gonna be fully impressive. So in French style, we said, yeah, let's make it big and just, you know, very visible. So what did we do? We started 
asking around if people had projects, and turns out uh, two of Eiffel's engineers were working on a tower they had seen uh, in New York. They had seen drawings of a tower uh, that used to be in New York that they also made for uh, World's Fair. That you was mean, pretty tall. You mean they've seen a tower that in New York that inspired them for that one? Exactly. Or they were working for one that was supposed to be in New York? No, they had seen uh, the images of a tower in New York, a lattice tower, basically, that was about yeah, 300 feet high, something in those waters. And they were pretty impressed. They were like, hmm, that's a good idea. We should try to work on it. So they actually started working on that uh, kind of skunk works, like a uh, personal project not sanctioned by the company. And they came to a drawing of a tower that was basically a tall triangle with multiple floors. They had five floors actually on the first uh, okay. sketch of the tower, the first draft. And they wanted to make it high. How high? About 300 meters, basically almost a thousand feet. Now today that doesn't sound that impressive, but back in the day this is absolutely mind-blowing and we'll talk about that in a second. Eiffel saw it but didn't like it too much. Now one of the architects working for Eiffel saw the plans and said that's a pretty good idea but it could use some work because you know we're French we like things being fancy so he started working on a concept and added a few things first of all he made the tower a bit shapelier he made it a bit more curvy because we like curves I mean I do it stays between us another thing yeah. is that he made only two floors so instead of having five platforms you only have two which makes it lighter, more exactly. beautiful. Yeah, more elegant. Absolutely. But also elegant. the curves, I mean, you know, it's, it's, uh, it, it makes it, you know... More organic. Light. Yeah, more organic, you're right. And this is what he also added. Can you see the kind of skirt, the half circle underneath the floor? It, it right makes here? it uh, an art piece rather Absolutely. than just uh, something practical. But that's the idea. Everything over here, this is why I talk about the kind of skirt underneath the first floor. Uh, that you're going to have uh, basically over here. Sorry yep. for my finger. Now, this is the only piece of the building that is not structural. That is the only piece that is decorative. Purely decorative. Purely decorative. So Everything that's why we else call it la jupe, purpose. the skirt. The skirt, la jupe. Okay. Because it's, because uh, we, we say in French, we, we, every word is a he or she. And yes. so the Eiffel Tower for us, it's a she. It's a she. Yeah. She is a lady. She. We actually call her the Iron Lady. Yeah, um, la, la, dame dame, de la Dame de Fer, you're right. And when Eiffel saw the revised version of the project, then he bought into it. And I mean that literally, he actually bought the patent from the two engineers and the architect. The two engineers who were working for him? Yes. So they got paid handsomely. Okay. Now, Eiffel bought the concept and then did, you know, his part. It wasn't actually engineering or designing, it was something pretty simple. He literally just sold the project to the government. He was in charge of marketing and doing the contracts, which is also kind of hard. And <laughs> yeah, that probably was the most difficult part. Absolutely. And what is interesting is that he basically submitted the, like, the tower to the government in 1895, and the government said, yeah, nah. Then we had an election, 1886. We don't see the point. Exactly. 1886, new election, and the new government is like, oh, that sounds pretty nice. And this new government, actually says we're going to sign off on the building but you know what it's kind of sensitive so we're going to help you but not too much we want to help you but we can't because politically it's you know charged because this is a very rich neighborhood and having a massive thing so to make sure that if is going to get the tower it's going to get the construction they said we want a building to celebrate the world's fair that's going to be 125 meters on each side and 300 meters high turns out the only company in the world that can do that is the you know so it's open for a competition. Anyone can submit their, uh, their own application, but only one company knows how to do stuff like that. Absolutely. Okay. You know, it's like when they... So he won. Yeah, so he won. And the government said, okay, you won, but we can't fund it. We can give you a million and a half francs, which sounds like a lot of cash. But the budget to construct the tower was actually six and a half million. Six and a half million francs. Any idea for how much it would be uh, today? I read it was something like 80 uh, million dollars. It wasn't actually that much. It was, I mean, it was a substantial amount of money, but it wasn't insane compared to it's what not, could have been. It's not billions. It's, it's not billions, absolutely. Um, and interestingly, Eiffel said, you know what? I'll take the deal. I'll provide my own money. So he actually uh, got a loan. I mean, he was Eiffel. He didn't have too much trouble getting a loan. 
Yeah, he because he was a, a a very famous businessman at the time. Yeah, by then he was already rich and famous. He was a household name. He had done constructions all around the world. And Eiffel said, you know what? I'll provide the rest of the money. I'll cover the rest. But I want a good deal. So he said, for the exhibition, I'm going to take all of the concessions, and then I want a concession for 20 years on the tower. And 20 the years? A concession years. for 20 years. I build it, I keep it for 20 years, and then it's yours. And then it's yours, you destroy it, you do whatever the hell you want with it. And the government said, haha, fool. The crazy thing is, Eiffel made his money back in three years if you count the taxes. If you don't, he actually made his money back in a year and a half. Wow. It's crazy. This, remember, this thing by, over here. By what? By selling tickets? By selling tickets, that's it. Remember, this building over here is the most visited paid monument in the world. Seven million people. I was about to say each year, but this year is a bit different. Yeah. Uh, so this it's is off the record for this year. Exactly. This this year doesn't count. Okay. Well, we we're going to go buy our, our uh, own uh, tickets then. Yes. And then start ascending the Dame de Fer. Okay, so we are in, we've bought our ticket, and we have a massive yellow cylinder right behind us. Yep. Multiple ones, actually. Multiple ones, yes. We are... Uh, whoa, whoa, whoa. Oh, they're, they're moving. Look at this. Cylinders are moving. So the idea is that the elevators actually function through hydraulics. Okay. So, so that's, that's for the elevator. Absolutely. That is for the elevator. And these push the hydraulics, so they push at the same time the elevator going up with a stem of pulleys and cables. It actually used to be chains and sprockets. And you can see the elevator going up as the cylinders go down. And you'll see them basically stopping. What happens is when it stops to the first floor, at the first floor, they're basically halfway down. When it goes all the way to the second, they go even further down. In this system, basically... So we're looking at, at what we cannot use, what we will not use. Well, we will not use because we're men of valor and okay. we'll, we'll go for the stairs. Um, but the idea is that the system hasn't changed that much since the tower uh, has been, well, basically constructed. Okay. Um, when they opened the tower, the system was a bit different, but this system has been here for about a century, actually more than a century. So sure, They've renovated them, they've taken care of them, but the system is basically the same. It hasn't changed much. And I tell you that because there has been change when we'll take the elevator all the way to the summit. That one has also changed, but we'll talk about it when we get there. Okay. This is for the elevators going to the second floor. All right, so this first elevator, we say goodbye to it. Yes. And we are now getting started with... The climb. The climb. All right, so let's switch to front video and start climbing. Okay, so we're not going to count the, the stairs, right? We, we, we not trust, yet. not yet. <laughs> they do it for you anyway, I'll show you. So they, they remind us that we have to keep uh, our distance. So they have added this blue line. It's not here uh, normally, right? No, normally it's not here. Uh, the stairs are somewhat original. So basically the stairs and the whole structure uh, used to look like this. So they have changed the floor, the stairs themselves, but the structure you see around, all the metal, the bolts, everything, are original. Remember, when they made the tower, these guys, they used 18,000 pieces of engineered metal, and they used 2.5 million rivets to wow. hold everything together. You can see them literally everywhere. And, and what are these uh, tracks we see uh, here? So these are for the elevator. Um, and so it's on, on tracks, like a funicular? Kind of, yeah, exactly. And on tracks and also so that way it can stop from going down. It's one of the systems uh, yeah, that's, that's a good point. That, that could be helpful. <laughs> um, you can actually see the cables starting to move a bit. Yeah. The cables holding everything. So these cables are, are holding the uh, elevator? Well, not only these ones. And they're going all the way to the pulleys connecting the system. Okay. So it's actually somewhat simple machinery. You know what? It's pretty cool because when you uh, when you take the elevator, you you miss on all of that because yeah, it, it goes very quite fast, and and you don't see uh, it all. So for now, I'm not yet uh, tired, so I I'm quite happy with taking the stairs. 
would you say you, you, you take the stairs uh, on tools? So my preference, my personal preference is if people are able to do stairs and the vast majority of the people uh, can do stairs. My mom can do stairs. She's in her 70s now. She's got diabetes. Uh, she's got a, she's quite a fair bit of a weight, but she can do the stairs. Okay. So, so it, it's not a, an exploit. I mean, no. it's... You can take your time and you will take your time anyway because the view is quite nice. And especially if you come in the summer, the weather is quite nice too. The stairs for the vast majority of people are doable and they give you a different experience. What I recommend is maybe go up the stairs and come down with the elevator. Let's see the elevator go down. Yeah. Wow, that is pretty fast. And some of you might have seen that there's actually a fake elevator driver on the bottom. Uh, yeah, that's true. <laughs> I, I, I always point that one when I give tours. There used to be a real a real elevator yeah. driver, yep. Uh, but now that we have technology and computers, they're not needed anymore. So that one is for, is for kids. And so these are the rivets you were mentioning? Yep, rivets everywhere. 2.5 million of them. And all the metal you see is original. And you can actually see how much paint there is on it. You I'm can gonna, see I'm the... gonna try to yeah. get the, the camera up. Sorry, guys. So these are the rivets. Yes, these are the rivets, remember, 2.5 million of them. And you can barely see the shape because now they've been covered in paint so often. Actually, the paint where it cracks, you can see how thick it is and how many layers yeah, of yeah. paint have been put there. Uh, you can actually see a bit of red paint over there, if you can see it. Let's it's try, not yeah. very visible all the way to the bottom. Um, it's it's kind of hard to observe. It's just all the way down there. Can you point, look at my finger, can you see it? Yes. I'll, I'll point my finger just over here. Uh, so that's the uh, red paint that's you were talking color. about? Absolutely. Wow. Uh, so it was really painted red? Yeah. Um, it's not a made up story. No, no, I try to not make up stories. Uh, <laughs> good, good it's point. kind of my job. So you can actually see the staircase is a different color from the tower itself. That's correct, that's true. Um, the lights were painted, or at least ordered different color back in the day. By the way, the lights, the, the lights right there, right? Yep. That shine up at night, that sparkle. We'll talk about this later. They're all over here. Thousands of them. At one point, they used to be up to 20,000. Now we actually have less because the lights are brighter and we don't have to change them as often because we've gotten better at light bulbs. Okay. Yeah. So still thousands, but not 20,000. Not 20,000 anymore. Wow. And this is one I like. Why did we start having lights on the Eiffel Tower? Publicity, advertising. Uh, the French car company Citroën in the 1920s uh, basically covered the tower in lights for publicity. Genius move. That's and true. since then, not only there's been lights on the tower, but there's also a searchlight on top that basically rotates around uh, all evening long. I heard that was for planes. Is that true? So like some kind of a lighthouse uh, not for uh, for ships, but for planes. There is still, for example, lights on top of the tower for planes, but you don't want to have a projector, especially one that spins for planes. That is completely for publicity. Okay. But there have been lights on top to signal it to planes, but the whole moving around and searchlight, that is for publicity. Okay. Well, it's it's been working and still works. Absolutely. Citroen has always been a weird company. I know I own a Citroen. <laughs> 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 Guys, uh, at home, Citroen is a French car company that's yes. from the early 1900s. Absolutely. You still make cars. And I don't know if you can still buy them in America. Nope. Uh, you can't. I don't it's think you've ever been able to. But they've always made weird, quirky cars that were super ahead of their time. And very comfortable too. It's a little bit windy, so I hope the sound uh, stays fine for you guys. But we will do uh, our best for it. How are you feeling? Uh, exhausted. Oh, come on, it's not too bad. You can still make sentences. I haven't been giving tours in six months. So, you know, that's my uh, daily sport usually. Yeah. The, we see the Invalides. All the way out there, the Golden Dome of the Invalides. Absolutely. And the uh, Montparnasse Tower. The most unpopular building in the city. Yeah. But we're going to talk about this when we reach the, uh, 
the first floor. floor. We're, we're not far from it. Oh no, we still, I think we're halfway. What I usually say is, the less light there is, the closer you are to the first floor. Yeah. Because at one point you walk in the tower. And you can feel, yeah, that it's, it's getting a, a little bit darker. Also, the space between the, the metal uh, beams is getting uh, shorter, yep. tighter. So that means we're reaching the, the platform. We are uh, slowly, slowly reaching the platform. Oh, that's pretty cool. I'll try to film, yeah, above the fence. They've, the, the fence was always here for the staircase? Yes. The yeah, fencing was always here uh, because they realized that not only people would fall or jump, but also that people have a fear of heights. Yeah. Um, today, we still have fear of, fear, of fear of heights, but you have to remember that when this building was made, it was something that had never, ever been done before. We start to be... Uh quite uh, at a height already. Yep. People are starting to look like ants. <laughs> All right, let's switch to, uh, to selfie mode. All right, so we're still on the Eiffel Tower, going up to the first uh, platform. And wh what are we going to find uh, out there? So on the first platform, uh, first of all, you're going to find a viewing platform. OK. That's expected. That's the point of it, yeah. Kind of. Uh, Ooh, you're going to find here. the usual the souvenir shops, uh, you know, they have a little place you can get coffee, which is very nice. Um, and souvenirs, this is huge. You gotta remember, uh, the elevators every day during the summer traditionally carry four tons of souvenirs every day up the tower. Four tons every day. Yeah, remember, this is open from morning all the way to midnight. And during the summer, in regular times, they sell a lot of souvenirs, a lot. So basically every day they bring somewhere between eight, 10 tons of food and up to four tons wow. of souvenirs for the elevators. There's actually an elevator that's dedicated to basically- To the supply. To the supplies. And this is what you were looking for. The elevators, uh, the supply elevator is also dedicated to the people going to the restaurants. There's two restaurants in the tower. There's one on the first floor that will be over there. Yeah. And there's a second one on the second floor. The first one on the first floor. Sorry, my breath is getting. <laughs> yeah, you can see it's, a, it's still a bit of a workout. And now the idea being that the restaurant on the first floor is something more of a brasserie, something a bit more for the common, common yeah. man. The one on the second floor is a gourmet restaurant. It used to have two stars in Michelin Guide. Wow. Yeah, now it's only down to one. I mean, it's still pretty still, decent. Yeah, yeah, it's, yeah. It's, it's, it's not Burger King. Uh, no offense <laughs> to Burger King. But <laughs> the idea is it's, it's pretty good. And if you book at the second floor restaurant, you get entry through the supply elevator, which means you don't have to stay in line. Not S at all. So some people actually book straight to the restaurant because if you're going to pay 80 euros for a ticket, you know yeah, what? Might as well add like... 20 bucks yeah, or, or, or 60 bucks for a great uh, dining experience. You get a meal, you don't stay in line, and you get access to the tower. So, But, but it's hard to, to, I mean, in a normal year with, you know, yes. the volume of people, the number of people visiting the tower, it's pretty hard to get your uh, reservation. It right? is somewhat hard. But, you know, sometimes you want to book, it's in a month, there's no more spots for the summit, but there are spots at the restaurant. So I've seen people do that. Instead of paying like 80 euros for a ticket, might as well add a bit more money and get an experience out of it. So next year, when you travel to Paris, make sure you contact us and we'll help you with the uh, Absolutely. With booking the ticket. We, we're going to uh, switch because we, we have to see the view. We've made it to the first uh, platform. Yes. OK, so you obviously can go all around the platform, but the view is not the same whether you look south, west, north, east. Absolutely. Uh, wh where is the Eiffel Tower located in Paris? So it's located somewhat westward. It is not central. Okay. So the center traditionally is um, displayed by Notre Dame. We're going to have Notre Dame, the city island, Ile de la Cité. This is the absolute dead center of Paris. It's actually the point zero of all French roads. Okay. Now we're about three miles west, about five kilometers west. So we're going to so, try to catch Notre Dame on the, uh, on the camera. 
and so we're looking to Paris this way and tac, tac, tac. it's pretty hard to do with uh, but guys up here you will find the Louvre there is the Gold Dome of the Invalids and Notre Dame Cathedral are the two towers that are just above my finger there so we're not so far but since Paris is a very dense city uh, there there are tons of monuments uh, in between right absolutely there's always something to see in Paris and I usually choose this view going north and eastwards because you get to see the most. If you point westwards, you get to see the suburbs, which are interesting on their own, but you know, maybe not what you came here for. Exactly. So here you're gonna see the hill of Montmartre. I don't know, let me get to the hill of Montmartre. I tried to make this uh, good looking for you on your screen. So that is the hill of Montmartre, up with the Sacré-Cœur Basilica. Uh, on top of it so that's the the north of the city that is the north of the city also the best neighborhood but i grew up there so i'm not okay the most impartial <laughs> it is it is a really cool neighborhood i do love it and um, what's what's in between there's something very close to us up oh, boom right oh, here. very golden yeah very golden so that is the russian orthodox church and also the embassy of russia uh Both? Which, yep it actually functions as the embassy the russian church and the russian cultural center is the whole thing. Okay. Um, it's kind of a middle finger, I love it. Um, so what happened is that our former president, François Hollande, yes. uh, didn't have the best of relationships with Putin. Yes. You might have heard of this guy. Um, <laughs> and Putin kind of wanted to, you know, again, show his power and be very, very Putin-y. Yeah. Okay. So what did he do? He built the Russian Orthodox Church over there. There's more Russian Orthodox Church in, in Paris. Let, let's show it again, yes. But he made it extremely bright. Why so? Because he knew he's very close from the Eiffel Tower and people are going to see it. Yeah, it's just by the riverside. I, I rode my bicycle past, uh, past it on the way here. Absolutely. And because it is diplomatic land, they can kind of do what they want to. Okay. It, so, but it was the embassy of Russia already? Yeah, it's on the grounds of the Russian embassy. Okay. So they can literally do what they want. Kind of, basically, yes. This neighborhood over here that you see where the Russian church is, is basically known as embassy neighborhoods. At least half of the buildings are embassies. Around the 7th district, yeah. Yeah, the 7th and the 16th. So the neighborhoods around the Eiffel Tower are chock full of embassies. And gorgeous buildings. Beautiful buildings. And this is why um, I always say every floor has a different flavor. The first floor is really nice if you want to see how Paris looks like from the top but you can still see the details you can see the buildings the inner courtyards you can see the gray roofs everywhere the second is good to see paris from a bird's eye view and the third floor is good to see the whole of the region so they all give you a different flavor here the first floor you get to see more of the details you can still see the people you can almost see their faces you can see the balconies you can see again uh, the inner courtyards of the building so it gives you more personal flavor this is why I like the first floor, the second yeah, floor. Yeah, you see more yeah. details. Uh, I, Absolutely. And, and so to get an idea of distance, uh, for instance, the, the Golden Dome we see right in the middle of the, of the screen right now, the Invalid, how far would it take, you know, how far is it uh, you know, walking? How long would it take to, to walk all the way there? It's actually not that far. It's, I think, a bit less than a mile. Okay. So yeah, that's doable. So like a ten, uh, like a twenty minutes. Yeah, let, let's make it twenty at a at a, at a slow pace. Rhythm. Yes, healthy rhythm. So if healthy you walk, rhythm, I like the, the exactly. expression. If you walk like a regular person, twenty. If you walk like an angry Parisian, make it fifteen. <laughs> if you're on vacation and eat an ice cream, make it thirty. Okay, so about twenty minutes, twenty twenty five minutes. Uh, Notre Dame would be much more than that. It's over an hour. Over an hour at a very leisurely pace. Yeah. Um, especially knowing Notre Dame that right. Here. Traditionally, you go along the river to Notre Dame, so it's not the shortest way. That's true, yeah. Yeah, yeah, but it's the nicest one. It is by far the nicest one. But, yes, budget an hour so you can take time and take a few pictures. Okay, well, thank you. Thank you very much for that. Uh, we have something a little bit uh, strange, or what, what is this, uh, uh, all these signs we have here? So it's about skylines and how tall buildings are. Now, you can see all the way to the end over here, you can see the Eiffel Tower, or good old Eiffel Tower, 1889. And then you can see the tallest buildings in the cities around the world. Now, 
this is why I alluded to earlier that this building when it was made was by far the tallest. In the world. In the world. Uh, you have to remember that way back in the day, we didn't have tall buildings. The Egyptians, that's 45 centuries ago, made the pyramids and the pyramids were almost 150 meters high. So that's a bit less than 500 feet high. And after that, we didn't go any higher. Remember, it took us almost 4,000 years until to the- To go past the to Great go past Pyramid. That height. And that was through a spire, the spire of the Lincoln Cathedral in the UK. Okay. So it took us almost 4,000 years. Wow. Remember, the Egyptians, Cleopatra is closer to the iPhone than the pyramids. You mean there are less years between Cleopatra and the iPhones than between the construction of the pyramid and her reign? Absolutely. Gosh, There's 2,500 years yeah, yeah, between the pyramids true. and her and 2,000 years between her and, well, satellites. So it's kind of crazy to think how old the pyramids were. And we didn't go past that for 4,000 years. And we didn't go that much higher. The tallest building in the world when we made the Eiffel Tower was the Lincoln Monument. Basically, if you go to DC, and but sorry, the Washington Monument, Lincoln's got his own statue. The Washington Monument was about uh, 170 meters high. So again, about 500 feet ish. Okay. And that's after 45 centuries. We went up about what? 20 ish meters, <laughs> 70, 80 feet, 4,000 years. That's not very good. But, but now it, it, get, it goes oh. so much faster because when we, so it's not ranked it's ranked by height, right? Not by year of construction. Uh, it's ranked by country. By country. By country, so it's kind of like to display everything. So the Eiffel Tower doesn't look like much, but back in the day, it's twice as big as the tallest building in the world. Twice as big as twice the... Twice as big. Oh, wow. It was a statement. So people were absolutely afraid to come up here because you have to remember, they had never seen that before. They actually thought it wouldn't be, because it wouldn't be doable, that people wouldn't be able to construct that because it was just too high and too insane. But they did it. And people were scared because they could, you know, put their hands outside. <laughs> Everything used to be made out of pure stone, so you couldn't see the light in. Here, well... You can go through, yeah. Exactly, it's lace. Almost. So, and, and so what's the tallest uh, structure now in the world? Today, it's this, the Burj Khalifa in uh, Dubai. And it's more than 800 meters, so we're looking at half a mile. Yes, half a mile in the sky. Uh, there's projects all around the world, uh, I think. Um, it, it's Saudi Arabia wants to build More a kilometer tower. More than twice the Eiffel Tower, right? More than twice, absolutely. Wow. And the, the huge one here. So Sky City in China. I'm not sure they've done this one. Uh, it might have been a project because this is a few years old. Uh, but they do have a 600 meter tower in Shanghai that I've seen and it's completely nuts. Wow. But yes, we're getting taller. We're gonna reach at one point structure limits. There's been talk of doing at one point a tower that's a mile high. How doable is this? Well, we'll see in a few decades. We'll see. So, but what, what is cool and probably what people don't expect is that there's some kind of a museum uh, here at the first floor of the Eiffel Tower. Yep. With photographs of Mr. Eiffel right here. Um, up, let me try to get better uh voila right here you should be seeing the photos much better now uh, mr eiffel and his family but also the uh, the different project of the company that's that's really cool yep so every floor is gonna have some pieces of info here you have more because the first floor has more space yeah so they do more displays yeah because the more you go up the the tinier the, uh, the level is and here. this is uh, photographs of the construction or inauguration of the eiffel tower so this is uh, the inauguration and you're going to have also a few pictures on the side of the construction. I remember oh, wow. construction actually went very fast. How long did it take? Two years. That's it. Two years. Two years. Yeah. Which wow. is crazy. And not only they finished on time, they actually finished early. Ha! <laughs> well, that's a very French thing. Is we, we finish early our, uh, our task, right? <laughs> Maybe back I'm not going to make jokes about finishing early. Um, <laughs> But yeah, and here you can see the structures that Eiffel has made all around the world. There's quite a few of them. So we have Vietnam here. We have Bolivia, Bolivia. You're going to have Croatia. Hungary. Wow, it's really the US. Chile. Yeah. Chile. Yeah, the, the US. Where's that? Yep. A bridge above the Niagara. Wow. 
he's really been all over the place. Yeah, so he didn't do them himself everywhere. His company at one point got big enough. Yeah. yeah. He had an army of engineers working for him. Oh, that's uh, right by my hometown. It's in the, yeah, it's in the Basque country. Mm -hmm. I always mention that I've come from the Basque country in this tour. You have to hype it, you have to hype it up. <laughs> I'm from Paris. There's nothing to hype. So <laughs> we're famous already. Well, that's pretty cool too. You know, it's, you're, you're a, a very rare spacey, uh, species of the original Parisians. Yeah. So and I'm oh. not completely angry. It's rare. <laughs> So we see actually a, a photograph of, of the, the paint. That's what they are doing right now. Absolutely. Okay. This one though is actually painting regular, so you don't have the mountain eaters. Yes, because it's uh, in, I mean, inside, if I can yeah. say. And now but you have to remember that back in the day, the they used to paint without any harnesses or, you know, safety measure. Wow, the guy OSHA is was just not a thing. The guy is just holding with his feet. Absolutely. And no, I mean, there must have been some people who've of died, right, during ma making so? So about 300 people were employed to build a tower. Um, most of them Italians. Okay. And surprisingly, only one person died during the construction because for the time, they actually had quite a few safety measures to keep the guardrails everywhere. So it was pretty advanced for his time. Now, only one person died building the tower and it wasn't actually during construction. One of the uh, employees, one of the builders, snuck in at night, came with a girl, Wanted to impress her <laughs> and fell. <laughs> yeah. Of so course, it had to be uh, something like that. So very the, Italian thing. So the guy built the Eiffel Tower, work here, and he has a date, and he takes the girl up the Eiffel Tower as you know uh, a premiere uh, yeah, exactly. before it opens, mm -hmm. and he falls. He he fell basically. Uh, he wanted to show up, so he fell. Sad story, but. The only death during construction wasn't actually during construction. So for the time, it was completely insane in terms of safety. It was like something almost unheard of. And so it's considered that no one died during the construction because it's not during office hours or by working. Well, technically, he wasn't liable. Let's put it this way. Okay. You couldn't sue him. Not that you could back in the day because, you know, laws and rights weren't really a thing. Anything else you want to show us here, or should we uh, keep going around the uh, first floor? I think we should go and walk all the way to the second floor. All right, so let's continue our way. Oh, there are these, yeah, the, I, I forgot how you call this in, uh, in English. Long Tell views? Us, long views? I think, I don't know. So, yeah, these are binoculars. First, they're, they're pretty good looking. I think it's great for your Instagram. Yes. Uh, but it's pretty cool, you know, and you, ha you can up have a view to the city. Obviously, we can't do that uh, on screen, but yeah, it's, it's true. The, the first floor has a lot of uh, cool things to do. And also, tiny pro tip, if you need a toilet, go on the first floor. There's way less of a line if you want to eat something, grab a coffee or go to the toilet. I recommend you do it on the first floor because afterwards, uh, it's getting very complicated, especially in the summer. Yes, because the elevator goes straight to the second floor. Um, so people who have tickets to the, uh, through the elevator, usually they don't come to the first one. It usually, used to yeah. stop, but it, it doesn't stop anymore. It used to stop. It usually stops on the way down, but not all of them stop on the way up. So traditionally, people also don't care about the first floor. They want to go all the way to the top yeah. straight. You know, give well, me everything now. Well, in, if we're talking as a museum, it's really at the first floor that you will see them. Absolutely. Next. All right. So we're going to get to the um, staircase and meet you guys back there. All right, so we're about to leave the, uh, the first floor. As you can see with our hair, but especially with yours, Manu, yeah. uh, it gets a little bit windy. It's so a tiny bit. <laughs> we hope the, the sound stays okay. Uh, behind us, you can see there's this huge glass uh, wall and floor, so you can actually see all the way down. We've already... Uh, uh, climbed at what 150 meters? Oh, no, uh, 50. Uh, now we're at 58 meters, 57, 50, 58, 58. 58. About 180, 190 feet. About okay. And so we're going to double that to get to the second floor. Absolutely. All the way up there. And here was the operator. Well, it used to be. So now. <laughs> We took a little break for the air. And how do you know you're close? Well, we said earlier that, A, it gets darker, but also once you go up, the Eiffel Tower wants to give you a bit of a, of a confidence boost. 
so if you don't know where you are you can just look on a site for example here 621 so from the ground you have climbed 621 steps we have made 621 already i know they don't feel like it right i told you it's not that bad it's actually not that bad yes and every 10 After steps the first 100 you just yeah think, you okay, just, I, I enter just a zone to, of pain have to make it so 630 and every 10 steps you're gonna have that's a cool a thing number. for tour guides also you, you know you, you're often asked how many uh, steps well you know you just say yeah you, you, you will find by yourself absolutely so we've passed 640 and we can see anyway that we are nearly at the second level because we have the elevators uh, exit uh, there and a nice welcome to the second floor spend Woof. your money please <laughs> please spend Give your chops now that you're tired sure. please spend your money have an overpriced so coffee 650 and and all the way there at the last and step. here is the light exactly here is the light and because the FL Tower staff is nice, the last step is actually numbered. 669. 600, oh, it's a bit dark. Very useful as a guide if you forget the number of 669. stairs. 669. Well, there could be a conspiracy theory about uh, 666. Six, Maybe nine. they made uh, an extra free step so people wouldn't talk <laughs> about it. Maybe, that is quite possible. Wait, 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 but there are more steps. Yeah, there's always more steps. Okay. But we, these ones it's are... It's to have the better view. Absolutely. So you can get on the upper platform, the platform where you also get the elevator to the top. Okay. Hop, 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 hop. Voila. Wow. Well, well, well worth it. Let me check the, the light a little bit. It's a bit today with the clouds all right I think we're perfect now not bad right <laughs> not bad you're kidding it is just gorgeous this is why I love the second floor you get a, a very decent view you still have details but you do get a bit higher and see more of the city the the, the red structure there that's the uh, the museum that's right? a museum the Quai museum the Quai museum uh, the museum we of, didn't uh, see it that well from the from the first floor we see much better now absolutely we have a bit more perspective. You can follow the, the River Seine, going this way, bridges after bridges, passing by the Louvre, Notre Dame, and then it continues this way, all the way, uh, almost to Burgundy. Absolutely. But we're not going to go uh, that far. Or maybe that's, another tour. That's right. Or maybe. available. <laughs> <laughs> Should we do a, a, a cycling tour from Paris until as much as we can? I mean, I'm up for it. I'm not sure anyone else would be. <laughs> well, I'm not sure I can go that far. I want to show you guys the view here because it's pretty stunning to go all the way to the top. And all the little triangles, if you look at them, all these are the lights that shine. The Remember sparkling the... one at night. Absolutely. Well, not spark... well, I mean, sparkling not necessarily. and not necessarily sparkling. Yeah, it lights up, up at night, night yeah. But the idea is that there's projectors for the regular lights, and then all of these are the ones that you can see sparkle. Remember, they sparkle for five minutes every hour on the hour. It used to be 10, but now the tower is going more green, so it's only five minutes. Also, it saves them money because the bulbs aren't expensive, it's replacing them, that is. Ah, yeah, that makes sense, because you got to pay someone exactly. who, who volunteers to climb all the way up there to go change, say, uh, that one here. Yeah, it makes sense. You don't have so many people who can uh, uh, qualify to go up there uh, so uh, safely. And this is something I'd like to talk about. Like this tower is still here and it's kind of a miracle. Because remember earlier I said that Eiffel got a 20 year concession on the tower. That is true. Yeah. yeah and we stopped talking about that. Yeah. You're correct. To, to, to remind us, the Eiffel Tower was built in 1889 for the World Fair that was celebrating the 100th anniversary of the French Revolution. It was supposed to be built for 20 years only. That was the deal between Eiffel and the newly elected government. And so in 1909, what's going on? It's 20 years later. So in 1909, the deal expires. And then there's a lot of questions. Should we keep the tower? A lot of people say, no, it's ugly. We still hate it. Some people say, well, it's iconic now. And the thing that truly really saved it is 
not that you know it wasn't necessarily worth that much in scrap money because a lot of people wanted to scrap the tower to well just you know make some cash just out of the, the metal. price of metal actually a guy actually sold the tower for scrap metal twice <laughs> yeah he managed to con people twice the I'm, first time they didn't I'm say anything turning back to you because yeah. i want to see your eyes when you mention that twice. one <laughs> no but like the first time they got conned and didn't say anything because they didn't want to look stupid so he was able to do it a second time the second time the guy was like what um that's the victor lustig story right absolutely it's guys that is a story that as as tour guides we we love very much is the, the the story of the man who sold the eiffel tower twice but actually uh, never did it too. never did and what happened what saved the tower something very simple i use it today radio radio waves ah. so starting 1903 they start basically uh, experimenting with radio waves on top of the tower and it turns out that radio waves are quite useful and the army is very interested the army is actually so interested they build a massive bunker underneath the champ de mars like the big grass area where we started that still exists today now it's been demilitarized it's been uh, decommissioned so yeah. you can visit it from time to time it's offices mostly and the tower was saved because the army so an interest in it it realized that telecommunications can be very useful and also that it makes a great and i mean truly great observation point point. and remember that this is five years before world war one there's a lot of tension around and it's quite useful to have a massive observation spot right in the middle of Paris so you can see what happens. And remember, that was actually used because the Germans came only 60 kilometers, 40 miles away from Paris, basically at the beginning of World War I. So it truly turned out so to be useful. So it has been, yeah, it was very useful. Absolutely. Because it's true, sometimes you hear that the Eiffel Tower was preserved because it saved Paris during the First World War, but the First World War started after the 20 years of the concession. Absolutely. It's just that during the First World War, it proved that Itself. it was very useful uh, for all this radio transmission. Yeah, and a lot of people asked, by the way, Eiffel, how are you gonna defend the tower from these new plane things and bombs and shells? And he said, the best defense is air. It's empty. Because what's it's gonna be damaged in an explosion is, well, literally matter. And here there's no matter, it's just air, it's empty. So things will just go through. This is why it actually stands to wind. It was actually tested for the wind. The it's, wind goes it's through. True. It's almost like a, a skeleton of some sort. Absolutely. Remember though, if you get all the way to the top on a very windy day, they actually close after a certain, like if the wind hits a certain speed, they actually close the tower, mm -hmm. uh, at least the summit. But the tower can sway up to, it's been known to sway up to 18 centimeters, which is about, uh, it's, it's seven, eight inches. Quite decent. You can feel it. Yeah. Oh, you can, yeah. You do get a bit seasick because you you go kind of like that. It's not huge, but it does make you a bit queasy. And same thing. It actually contracts a bit, a few centimeters, three, four centimeters, like an inch or two during the winter, and it can expand about fifteen centimeters the in heat? the summer. Wow. The metal. And all of it was known at that time, and it was calculated to be Absolutely. able to resist. It is good, within the margin of tolerance. engineering. So it's not just in style that we're good. It's also in engineering. And remember, that was before computers. Well, yeah, every yeah, calculation sure. and drawing was made by hand. And everything was actually pre-built, pre-formed, and then brought over here. And this is the magic of 19th century. You pre-form everything of this incredible tower, and you brought it here by horse cart. <laughs> because 19th <laughs> the, century. The old and the new. That's, yeah, that's really, really cool. Um, so now we've made it uh, We've spent quite some time on the first floor. We've seen the, the second floor. Should we take the elevator and go all the way to the top now? I think we should. All right, so let's go there. And we have to take a separate elevator to go to the second floor, uh, which is a much narrow one and one that doesn't use the big pulleys like that one. So we are going to meet you guys back because we can't film in the elevator but we are going to go there you see there's no one for those of you who've been on the Eiffel Tower before you know that there's usually is a bit of a line uh, down there it's never that long but sometimes it can take you know a good 20 minutes um, and we will see you all the way up okay we have made it to the top we have indeed we are at the last floor the third floor of the eiffel tower the summit 
and there is nobody there is else no one. but us. It is amazing. There I have never seen in the elevator. The, the tower like this. Yeah, in the elevator, it was the two of us, the guy and the operator. Then the operator, and we had a cool chat. It takes one minute and 20 seconds to go from the second floor all the way uh, to, to the, the third floor. So it's it two meters a second. I have no idea how much. That's going to be like six feet second. Six feet a second, yeah. Uh, I have no idea how much that is in kilometers per hour or miles per hour. But that's, that's pretty quick. But you don't feel it. Uh, no, you do feel so the quick. pressure in your ears, though. Yeah, because you, yeah, that's true. But I mean, it's the first time I was almost on my own. Uh, I mean, you were kind of my date. Yeah, you know, I know, I know. In the, in, the, uh, in the elevator. And now we are the only one uh, on the platform. Oh, actually, there are two other people. So it feels like, you know, we've been cheated. It's not really a exactly. private Exactly. Where's my private, tour private experience? Where's my premium experience? Of the Apple Tower. Um, should we, because, guys, the, uh, the, t the summit is made of, of two levels. Absolutely. So the first one, you can see behind us that there are still walls and windows. Uh, there is quite a nice view uh, to the city, but I'm going to change to the front camera for that. All right, so with the front camera, this is the view you can see from the top of the Eiffel Tower with the Trocadero, right, uh, in front Absolutely. of us. That big, looks like a bracket almost. A bit, um, massive half circle, you could say. Um, this is the main square that was, again, made for the World's Fair uh, in 1946. They leveled the place, made this big kind of theater on top of an older theater. And that was supposed to be the entrance to the whole thing. To the new World Fair. Absolutely. It was made, it was planned to be a massive entrance as usual. Massive, humongous, planned, very geometrical, very French. Yeah. <laughs> Indeed, and very 1930s. Yeah. And all the way there. Tuk, 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 tuk. Up right above my finger is the Arch of Triumph. Let's see that a little bit better right there. So the Arch of Triumph, which means the Champs Elysees are going just down there. It's a massive structure, yet it looks so small from here. It looks positively tiny from here. It's 50 meters high. It's again, 170 feet or something. It's huge, but it looks like a toy from here. It does look, it does exactly like a Lego brick or, uh, or something Almost, like yes. that. And if you see it in real life, if for those of you who have been to Paris, it's absolutely massive. All right, Lee. So we are now, uh, we're going to see the view a little bit more afterwards, but I want to, s to show you guys what the inside is like when you go on a tour of the Eiffel Tower with Manuel. He privatized the Eiffel Tower for you. See, as I'm going, Further away, you because don't that's see what we anybody do in this company. else uh, but us. It is quite, quite an experience. And you can uh, see the original yourself. structure of the tower. This hasn't changed. So you can still see the rivets. You can see the iron. This is, this is still the same. Those are, absolutely. are part of this two million rivets you were uh, mentioning. Yeah. So the original structure is the same. Obviously, they have uh, changed the elevators a bit. They have added a few amenities, but in itself, the structure hasn't changed much. Hasn't changed since the day that photo was taken. This visit of engineers. So this is Gustave Eiffel. You have here and visitors back in the 1800s who, uh, you know, because obviously scientists, other, uh, other architects, engineers, they wanted to see what the, the tower was like. So we're going to take these stairs yes. and go to the uh, summit of the summit after you. Thank you very much. It's a bit windy on the summit, apparently. So yeah, it's a bit windy. It's always windy up the Eiffel Tower. True. It's, it's always cold and windy. Much R more than it is in the city. So if you come and visit all the way to the summit, pack an extra layer. Yes. That's my recommendation, especially on days like those where it feels kind of nice in a shirt all the way down, but it won't necessarily be all the way up here. And again, this is, if you shoot this plan over here, this angle, this is unknown. This is, <laughs> it's crazy. This is no one at all. I have been whatsoever. here countless times uh, during the day, during the night, in January, in August. I have never seen 
So I am like so a kid. This is my people. birthday right now. Look, I'm, I'm alone. I can do push-ups. I could just like dance. Do push-ups. Like... Let's see if you can do push-ups. All right. I can the do guy is doing, yeah, he's doing his workout on the Eiffel Tower. Okay. I'm clapping. He is All clapping. Right. He is clapping. Bravo. And I, I am oh. like a four-year-old right now. <laughs> I am sorry we make you go through this, but you, this is my pleasure. Um, anyway, coming back to the tower. Remember right now we are on top of the tower. This is the top of it. And the platform over here. Above us, it's, the, it's a, still a radio antenna? Absolutely. So this is actually not just a radio antenna, it's a everything antenna. You got 4G over here, you got the radio, you got the TV. You've got every wave possible is gonna be emitted from here. This is the main TV tower for Paris. Radio tower, actually surprisingly in the east of Paris, uh, near to where I live. And here the platform where we're underneath was 276 meters and here you can actually see it it tells you 280. So we are looking at about 910 feet, 920 feet or something. And the very, so the very, very top, on top of the antenna, that will be another uh, 40, uh, wow. 40 meters. So that so means there's almost 40 meters of extra antennas and layers and floors. To be fair, when the tower opened, if you come here and actually point up. I think it's a bit windy. Uh, it's, it's a bit windy, sorry, yeah. Um, if you go uh, up, I you guess can actually on the, see... on the other side, it, it, there yeah. should be less wind. There's actually a few extra floors over there. And these floors, when it opened, went all the way to 300 meters. Then they added extra, extra towers, which today raises it to 324. 324. So, um, it, but so again, it is taller than the Montparnasse Tower we yes. see there. Which is about 200 meters. It's only two thirds the size of the tower. Two thirds, wow. Still respectable. Yeah. And if you look in Paris, if you make a tower that high, it completely, well, <laughs> towers over the rest of the city. Because you can see the invalids over there look massive, and yet they're not that tall. The building's not that tall. Paris is quite a flat city. Buildings are supposed to be six, seven, eight floors, traditionally. Yeah, we, you, we see that very, very well from here. Maybe even better than at the uh, second floor. This is why here you have a really bird's eye view and you can see all along, you can see the Louvre over there, it's pretty massive, but you can see the suburbs. Um, you can see pretty much all the wooded areas around Paris. So here, the city feels almost like a toy, like That's something true. you'd build out of tiny, and, tiny and Lego. we can see, oh my God, that, that is rain out there. That is raining. It is raining a lot. Uh, where are we uh, down there? It's, it's, there's east. a bit of mist over here anyway. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's... it's yeah, we're lucky. It's not raining on the Eiffel Tower, but it's raining in the east of Paris. So somehow we are lucky. <laughs> well, we have to be a bit today. And you can see the center of You can see all of the bridges. Remember, 37 bridges in Paris. There's a bridge every about 300 yards, 300 meters. They're everywhere. And so down, I mean, up there, that's the Louvre. So yes. the big green space. I don't know if, if my finger looking like this is, is nice for you guys, but it's to help you. Uh, these, these are the uh, uh, Tuileries Garden, and then this big structure out there, that is the Louvre. So the center of Paris, basically. Yeah, and we talked about education and every floor having a few things to learn. So obviously the first floor has the most, because you can see the space is obviously much bigger than here. but. This floor has something that's quite interesting. It has Gustave Eiffel's office. Ah, yes. Because, yes, he did have an office. Um, well, I think office is kind of, hmm, how to put it? Basically over describing it because it wasn't really an office. You think he'd come here every morning, take the elevator, have coffee, a croissant, and then, you know, look at the order of the day. It wasn't like that. This wasn't really an office. It was more of a tiny lab. It was a space you could use on top of the tower for radio experiments, for example. Oh, more yeah. than an office itself. Now they made it an office. So you can see over here Eiffel and a mock-up of Edison, Thomas Edison, the famous Edison. But in real life... So this is Gustave Eiffel. On the right and Edison on the left. And then on the other side. C can yes. you move just a little bit like this? Because yes, when you're there, we can see Edison through your okay. reflection in the... Wonderful. <laughs> I link the people to the past. <laughs> and, and there's a lady in the back. Yes. Um, That's Gustave Eiffel's daughter. Yeah. She, she's, she worked with him 
uh, even till the end, because he, he went, I mean, he was caught in a few political uh, scandals and financial scandals at the end of That's his life. That's the thing, when you run a big construction company, you're bound to have a few of those. Yeah. <laughs> Nothing changes here. But yeah, and this is why... So Thomas Edison discussing... <laughs> well, probably life, business. Um, That's but pretty cool. Yeah. This is actually a very important place for radio transmission and uh, weather. They also did a lot of experiments on weather over here, um, meteorology. Yeah. This place was used as a lab for a long time and still today. There's a lot of sensors on top, for example, for the French Weather uh, National okay. Association. Yeah? Yeah. Because it gives you unrestricted access to the whole of the region. Ah, but that's true, of course, yeah. And, and same thing for radio, blah, blah, blah. And the, uh, the, the, the metal structure, that's, that's the true structure, right? That it's is the original, make... yes. Okay, so because yeah. you still have the beams. I mean, you built this office, quote unquote, but you still have to respect the structure. So it goes literally around so the beams. Beam. Yeah, I mean, you know, you're in the Eiffel Tower, so you want to have parts of it. Uh, Absolutely. In it. All right, should we... Is there anything else on the top you would like to show us? We've seen views toward the center, toward the uh, uh, Arch of Triumph. You want, maybe we can show a little bit the, um, the financial district of La Défense? We could. Um, on the other side out there? Yes, we can go there and show you uh, the CBD, the business district. No, there have to be more people now. Yeah. We've, we've had our, uh, our, our, three, our, our three, four minutes. Of, uh, of glory. Right there. So coming back to the Trocadero, you can see all the way to the back. Well, I mean, I don't need to point it. You can see it over there. Um, this is La Défense. So why do we have a massive business district in what looks to be the kind of middle of nowhere? Because you can see a massive wooden area. Um, the idea is that we ban skyscrapers from the city. The Montparnasse Tower, the big black uh, ugly tower you saw earlier, well, it turns out it was very, very unpopular. Yeah. So when it was built in the 70s, still people, is. still very much is, people kind of rebelled against it. They protested it. So the city banned skyscrapers uh, or things like hypermarkets, like massive, massive supermarkets. So in order to have towers that any big prosperous city should have traditionally, you have to build them outside of the city. In La Défense over there, the massive business district is technically not part of Paris, hence the towers. It's, it's true, the, the city of Paris ends right after the, the park there, the Bois de Boulogne. Absolutely, yeah. And so after that, you have a different regulation because you're not in the city Paris. of Paris. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So they're not incorporated in the same city, thing, the same county, so they can do whatever they please. And this is why you have the massive towers basically stuck over there. It's, it's, I, I like this view because you, you have this more classical, uh, what we call the Haussmannian for the, the, the man who was in charge of redesigning Paris in the 1800s. So you, you have this more classical, uh, chic Paris view and toward the end, it reminds us that we, I mean, we live in a beautiful city, but it's not a, a, a fixed museum and things can, uh, can change and, and Paris is not uh, bound to remain in ancient True. times. This is something people are surprised often about, uh, about Paris. They're surprised that Paris is not just a museum, but it's actually alive, that it moves, it changes. Because remember, it is 12 million people, it is the capital of France, it is one of the biggest cities in the world, most prosperous, blah, blah, blah. So it is a city that still moves with the times and you can see it pretty well over there. This too is a good example because this was completely, basically different than the architecture you used to have in the neighborhood that you saw all the way down with those Haussmann buildings, Second Empire. Yeah. People were angry at the Eiffel Tower and now we are quite happy it's there. They were so angry, in fact, that um, you had what was called the Club of the 300. You had 300 intellectuals that made a petition against the building. And the one leading them was actually Charles Garnier, Charles Garnier in French, yes. that was the architect of, of the, the opera. opera. Don't get Who, more classical. in his own time, when he built it, Absolutely. was criticized for being too modern or too... Uh, Absolutely. Uh, and different. he said that he hated it. Which is very interesting because he was actually on a jury selecting the building. So he said yes to the Eiffel Tower and then said, oh, I don't like it. <laughs> Which I think is an interesting position to hold. Classic 
Classic French, you would say? Yeah. Yeah, we like to complain. It's our national sport, as we say. What a view. All right. That was really cool. Yeah. Uh, we're going to make our way we should to, make the, our yeah. to the ground. And it will be a great place to, to say goodbye. I'm going to film just a little bit more the River Seine because it looks so nice and great from here. The, 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 the boat you see passing by is actually, it's not a, a, a boat cruise. Uh, there are very few uh, boat cruises operating at the moment because obviously there are way less uh, visitors. But it shows you that the River Seine is also used for, uh, I mean, this is for construction. Uh, it's construction. College, uh, yeah. yeah. More and more, we, uh, it used to be full of basically boats hauling wares on the river as far as a few decades ago. But it's starting to come back because it is um, well, more green than riding yeah. trucks everywhere. And it does give you central access to Paris. Which is a very, very rare thing, and there's no traffic jam. Absolutely. So it actually starts to make sense again to have boats carrying things along the river. Uh, one chain of supermarkets actually uses boats more as a publicity stunt, but they use the boats to carry, again, the goods all the way to the stores. And deliver. Yeah, that's, that makes sense. All right. So that was really, really cool. We are going to go all the way down now. I'm filming all the way up and then we'll see you guys back down the Eiffel Tower. All right, so we are near the end of this uh, tour up the Eiffel Tower. We've been walking our way up, taking the elevator to go down. It was quite an amazing tour. Thank you very much, uh, Manuel. My pleasure. If, if you were to, to sum up the interest, the reason why the Eiffel Tower is so famous uh, and still today, and if it's worth um, going when you visit Paris, what would you say? I mean, I know the Eiffel Tower, visiting the Eiffel Tower is a bit of a cliche. It sounds a bit but sometimes there's a reason why it classic. That's true. And the first one is it's in terms of engineering, you got to remember that this was mind blowing. Remember, 45 centuries, after the pyramids, we had just gone basically 20 meters, 70 feet. That's nothing. And this came and doubled the height of the tallest building. This was unknown. This was breaking barriers. This was insane. You got to remember, people were scared of going up the thing. That's true. Truly yeah, scared yeah. because this was something they had never seen before. They couldn't even conceive. Think about the first movies. Think about first time they had electric lightning. This was a game changer. Now, another thing is also that, you know, we're French. So sure, we do engineering, we've done Airbus, we've done cars, whatever, rockets, you name it. But at the same time, we like beauty. We like form and function. And that's <laughs> it. Sure, yes, it's a big tower, but it's a beautiful one. It's airy. It's yes, full of it, lace. It's not just simple uh, technical Absolutely. prowess, but it's, it's made uh, with style. Exactly. We could have made a tower with just beams around. But what did we do? We made it beautiful. We added something pretty incredible to it. And I think that good style is timeless. And this has been proving it for about 130 years. Now, the last thing is really the bird's eyes view on the city. Um, to be fair, Paris is quite a flat city. Um, the highest point is 130 meters, 400 feet. In Montmartre, yeah. Exactly, it's pretty flat. As you can see, there's no big skyscrapers around. It's not London, New York, Hong Kong. The city is limited in height. So, so if you want to have a view uh, of the entire city, exactly, it's probably uh, the best option. Absolutely, it makes it extra special. You go up there and that's the beautiful thing. You have the first, the second, the third floor, so you have options. You want to see the monuments a bit closer, you want to see the buildings, you want to see how people move around, sure, get to the first floor. You want to have a bird's eye view of the city but still be able to make out the details, go to the second floor. You want to see all of the immensity of the city, the 12 million people that make the Paris region, go all the way to the top and feel like a bird, like an eagle. It gives you a choice. And I have, there's one question, especially when it's the high season and there are a lot of people visiting, etc. Uh, some, and if you cannot have the tickets to go all the way to the top, do you think you're missing the entire experience? Or if you go to the first and second floor, it's already you've had most of it. Okay, to be fair, I'm gonna tell you something uh, that maybe I shouldn't tell you, it's a secret. I think the best pictures are from the second floor and yeah. the best observation deck is on the second floor. So 
it's not necessary to go all the way to the summit. It's more to say you've done it. But exactly. It, it, it's, it's not a better experience. It's not necessarily a better experience. I would suggest for me the true experience is getting the stairs to the second floor because you get to experience walking up the tower. You feel the tower, literally you feel it. Yeah. You know, and you see much more of it. of it. Exactly. You can put your hand on a rail and feel the metal kind of vibrate with your steps. You can see the city, you can put your hand for the tower and you see the inner workings, which you don't get through the elevator. You get a more clean cut experience. That's true. So I know, again, it sounds a bit cliche, but this isn't just a tower. It's become kind of the image of Paris, the soul of the city. Yeah, well, clearly you, you do that and people uh, assume exactly. it's the, uh, the Eiffel Tower in Paris. Most famous monument in the world. And there's a reason why it's been copied all around. Again, a classic is a classic for a reason. All right, well, thank you very much uh, for this tour. I hope you guys have uh, appreciated this uh, new tour. We will be back uh, week after week, thanks to your support, guys. Uh, don't hesitate to tip your guide in the, you have a link uh, just here. And it also helps us to uh, acquire new material, like these new uh, uh, microphones. The microphones. So hopefully the, uh, the quality is best. Anything can happen during these tours. Uh, that's the beauty of, uh, doing, <laughs> living, in Paris. of living in Paris and, uh, and doing these tours. So it was uh, uh, quite a great experience. Thank you very much, uh, Manuel. Thank you, Bertrand. Thank uh, you, My Pirate Paris. And I, thank you guys for watching. And if you want to see Manuel on another tour, you can check on our browser channel. You will see when Manuel and I, we went up and down the uh, Arc de Triomphe. You make me do the stairs a lot, right? You make me do stairs a lot. Uh, you can see it that way. We'll see. All right, bye. Have a good one.